Now, gentlemen, <laughs> you claim this to be a work of fiction. Yes, yes. As senior press gallery journalists, you are aware of the laws of defamation in Australia? Yes, Chris? yes. Should we be? Steve? <laughs> yes. Perhaps you are more aware than others of the laws of defamation in this country? Steve is. <laughs> Why would that be, Steve? Well, working for News Limited, I mean, every day is a... Uh, no, no, I'm not sure what Chris means by that. You work for the ABC. <laughs> you work for the ABC. How many legal writs have you got at present, mate? Not at present. I haven't got that many. Uh, uh, None that I'm aware are of. Are you involved in any court matters? Are you? I'll be asking, I'll be asking <laughs> questions at this point. I'm sorry. Um, in several high-profile cases in Australia, the following standard for libel in fiction has been established. The description of the fictional character is so closely akin to the real person claiming to be defamed that a reader, knowing the real person, would have no difficulty linking the two. Given that standard, do any of your characters risk exposing you to a defamation action? Uh, I think not mainly because we spent a lot of time talking to lawyers when we were writing this book. And I, I, I turn to this very small disclaimer, which I hope I can read right at the front, and I point you towards it. I'm because pleased you've turned to that disclaimer, because might I point out to you, Chris... Oh, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but might I point out to you... <laughs> Unlike most disclaimers, this one has an additional sentence. It goes beyond the boilerplate like all works of fiction, etc., then it says, so please do not interpret anything that happens in this book as a real event. It goes on. I, su I suggest to you that you protest too much. Uh, can I read the first part, since you are partially quoting what we, uh, we put in our legal disagreement? Uh, no, you may not. OK. Um, <laughs> let's test the disclaimer with the main character, the protagonist or should I say antagonist in this case, Katrina Bailey. Mm. Mandarin speaking ex-Prime Minister who set an inhuman work pace, obsessed by the media cycle, described as socially autistic, <laughs> prone to using incomprehensible words, then contrived to the more common, come on, cobber, betrayed by her deputy, the first Prime Minister to be dumped before an election, returns as Foreign Minister, hell-bent on revenge, do you stand by your claim Female. that this character is a work of fiction? Female, and can I point out to you that for all but one chapter in this book, she is in a coma in Canberra Hospital, and although I think you might be referring to Kevin Rudd, some of his colleagues might wish he was in a coma in Canberra Hospital. It is not the case. I would alert your lawyers immediately. Nobody mentioned Kevin Rudd. Let's assume for the purposes of this interview that the events are fictional. Some of the detail is quite fascinating. Let me take you to the description of Emily Brooks, the right-wing warrior. The description of her apartment in Canberra during the oh. sex scene. Yeah. Mm. Is that from personal observation? <laughs> Look, I can't go into Steve Lewis's methods, uh, but, but we did put in a lot of research from this, Steve. Thanks very much, mate. <laughs> he seemed to know a lot about the Assyrian rug. There's one scene where the transvestites within the Canberra Public Service <laughs> all come together for a drinking and dancing session. Have either of you, in your professional capacity or otherwise, been drinking and dancing with transvestites? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Have you been in the National Press Club on a Thursday night? <laughs> Hello. Canberra lets its hair down, and I mean, you know. Can I say one of the fact, Julie, no. Can I say one of the things that's, that's fascinating about this book, with the, you know, everyone saying, "Oh, this is this character, and this is that character." One of the one of the reviews, which was really amusing, was when someone said, "Yes, this is clearly this person, this is clearly that person." But the thing that gives this away is how could there possibly be a transvestite that worked in the Defence Signals Directorate in Australia when you need such a high security clearance? Well, there happens to be one. Well, coming to your theory of a recognisable landscape. A still handsome journalist in the press gallery? <laughs> and, and he noticed almost... Well, bonjour, no, come on down. I mean, what, what, <laughs> I know. Have you seen how much weight he's lost? Bonjour, no. So Harry Dunkley is whom? 
Harry, Dun well, Harry Dunkley is clearly a, uh, a made-up character because uh, he's an ethical journalist who works in Canberra, so I mean... <laughs> uh, uh, Chris, you know anyone who might fit that description? No, but I do know that all of the characters, male and female, that we have <laughs> populating the book, both of us being gentlemen over the age of 50 now, just are all quite good-looking. Chris, I think it's time we came to perhaps some of the more personal elements in the book. Mm -hmm. If I can just lean forward yeah, a little. Yeah, lean um, You were... A student priest. I was, like your leader. One observation in the book is that Catholic men react in different ways to their religious upbringing. They either feel guilty all the time about their body and its needs, or they rebel and engage in sex like there's no tomorrow. Which category do you place yourself in? <laughs> Absolutely and undoubtedly in the feeling guilty all the time. <laughs> because to answer any other way would get me into an enormous amount of trouble. <laughs> in many instances in the book, the fate or the destiny of the main characters is determined by the leaks. Now, in your experience, mm. when leaks are made against a minister, mm. do they more often come from the bureaucracy, the minister's own party, or the opposition? Gee. Um, <laughs> How long have you got? Yeah, exactly. It depends on the, it depends on the purpose of them. Uh, I would say that, that of all of those, the ones that happen least often are the ones that come directly from the bureaucracy. I know now, having been twice investigated by the Australian Federal Police, that when... In, uh, only twice? Only twice. Sorry. <laughs> what are you up to now? Double but figures. That... Uh, that that when the government really genuinely doesn't know when a leak, where a leak comes from, that's usually where it ends. Uh, so that sometimes is, is uh, an indicator as to where those things might come from. But quite often there are people who leak against their, their own in order to do their own damage. I mean, imagine a case where, for instance, for, for instance, instance, hypothetically, uh, imaginary world of uh, politics where, for instance, a journalist is there and someone rings them up and they want to leak against their own boss. I mean, somebody who actually worked for a senior political figure, like maybe the President of the Senate or that other, what's the other position in the House of Reps? The uh, mm, Speaker. Escapes, Speaker. Escapes me for the moment. Imagine if one of their own staff wanted to leak against... I mean, I know, we know it wouldn't happen, but, I mean, that would be extraordinary. Um, would it? I think so. I think so. Have you ever felt, you Steve, might, uh, that you've been used as a pawn in a much oh. bigger and more important game? <laughs> Oh, he shuffles uncomfortably. Uh, you, you know, it, it is interesting. I mean, uh, if you look back over the last 20 years and, and all the great stories that have been leaked, and there have been heaps and heaps, uh, you are being used. You, I mean, journalists are part, journalists are part of the, uh, the political game, and um, I think it's undoubted that, uh, that you, are, you are being used to uh, get a message out there, and um, you are... Um, you are. Uh, occasionally, um, uh, involved in uh, in instances that become uh, celebrated affairs, if you like, and um, of course you're going to be I mean, used, but you certainly have to be aware that you're going to be part of someone's game. You always are. And Harry Dunkley points that out in the book. He says that journalists are always part of someone's game, and, but in this instance, when he's working on this story, he couldn't work out at first whose game he was part of, and that's you need to know what game's being played and what the purposes are. Thank you.